This is Dr. Ed Bingham from Marshall University, and I'm welcoming you here to learn a little bit more about your saxophone. Uh, and we all know saxophone is a wonderful instrument. It was invented by Allo Sax in about 1840. So it's absolutely a little bit of a newcomer to the instrument world since it's only been around for a little, about 150 years or so. So anyway, you know about your saxophone. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things uh, that you should know very well. One of the things is getting your horn you know, checked out by a repair shop once or twice a year, even if nothing's wrong with it, because usually there are some adjustments or maybe leaky pads that they can fix. And it's really uh, helpful to stay ahead of that thing. And so making sure that, you know, a repairman knows if something needs adjustment on your horn. Um, now, putting the horn together, as we take it apart, show you a little couple of things, okay? You probably can't see this very well, but this is the called the tenon that connects the body to the neck of the saxophone. And oftentimes we have trouble getting this in and out, all right? So a lot of times people will make the mistake of putting cork grease on that tenon, and that's the wrong thing to do. It just makes it worse eventually. So what you wanna do is get a nice cloth and make sure that this tenon joint, both here and inside the saxophone, are kept clean. If it's kept clean and is in proper adjustment, you'll have no trouble putting the saxophone together. So that's one of the important things to know. And then also keeping the cork properly lubricated. And for that, we use cork grease. And this is another thing that helps putting your horn together easily. And you want to make sure that that cork grease is rubbed really well into the cork, okay? And you might take a little soft cloth and wipe off any excess. And if you do that, then putting your mouthpiece on is a piece of cake. All right, so after a while, if you're tuned up well, your cork will sort of conform to the diameter of the mouthpiece and you can more or less know when you are in tune by the position of your mouthpiece, okay? Sometimes I will have students mark that part with a piece of, you know, with a pen, uh, put some ink there so you know where to put the mouthpiece in each time. And that's sort of a starting place to work with your tuning. Okay, for your reeds, I oftentimes will use, you probably can't see this because it's invisible, right? This is a synthetic reed, it's clear. It's made by Legere, L-E-G-E-R-E. -E. And these are nice because you don't really have to wet them up and they last a long time. They don't last forever, but they last a good long time. So those are good. Also, regular reeds here. And if you use regular reeds, it's a good idea to find a reed case for them. All right, this one says sell them. Um, so that the reed, when, after you use it, is allowed to dry flat, okay? And also it's in a case so it doesn't stand the chance of getting broken in your case. All right, the little things that the reeds come in, the little sleeves, are not a good thing to store your reed in, all right? Because they're not perfectly flat, you'll do better to have a reed case, okay? Now, see a lot of students sometimes will put their reed on the mouthpiece and then put the mouthpiece on the horn. And that's really not a good idea because nine times out of 10, the reed moves on the mouthpiece. So make sure you put your horn together to the mouthpiece first, take your reed and you may want to soak it or make sure that it's wet and put it on the mouthpiece and hold it at the end like this, okay, so that it doesn't move. Then you take your ligature and very carefully place it onto the mouthpiece and ligature, or onto the mouthpiece and reed. And you can adjust the reed with your fingers on each side of the reed on this part of the mouthpiece, okay? 
and then gently tighten up the screws. Don't over tighten them, but just enough to keep things really well secured. Okay, so you have a completed saxophone ready to play. You might notice this contraption I have on me. Okay, this is a saxophone harness. Um, they're a little expensive, but after many, many years of a saxophone neck strap hanging around your neck, sometimes you get some neck pain, and this really helps, especially with lower instruments like berries and tenors, okay? Altos work fine with it. If you're gonna have a regular neck strap, um, get one that is not stretchy, okay? The knee attack ones are stretchy and they let your saxophone bounce around in your mouth uh, and really don't help your embouchure very well, okay? Fundamentals of playing. This is a wind instrument, and guess what? You have to put wind inside it. And that comes from you through the mouthpiece into the horn. And we have to put enough wind in there to make the horn sound properly. So, one of the ways you can learn how to get enough breath, you wanna be taking a relaxed breath that makes your stomach area expand. So I'm gonna take my hand on my stomach, Take a full breath, my stomach area expanded, and my shoulders didn't rise, okay? So that keeps things relaxed here, and it makes the best inhalation from your abdomen. Now, putting the horn or putting the air through the saxophone involves pressurizing the air. A good thing to do is to hiss. So you'll know by putting your hand on your stomach, Inhaling from your stomach and hissing like a snake or a cat will give you the sensation of what your stomach muscles, <coughs> excuse me, your stomach muscles need to do in order to pressurize the air to put it in the saxophone. Okay, you can hear the air in the saxophone as try that, okay? Sometimes we call that lion's breath. We're not putting any pressure on the reed at all, having your lips relaxed around the mouthpiece. And you get that nice air sound. All right, saxophone embouchure then is having your lower lip over your bottom teeth, okay? Importantly, your upper teeth on top of the mouthpiece. I have a little cushion there that helps me keep the mouthpiece in a constant position. It also reduces the vibrations on my teeth, so it's a little more comfortable. Okay, so we have top teeth on the mouthpiece, top lip sealing the air, bottom lip over the bottom teeth a little bit, okay, and the corners of our mouth in. Sort of like you're saying when you say, ooh, 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 corners in, lip over, teeth on the mouthpiece, okay? So, and that should be, Oh, about a half, three quarters of an inch, okay? So, if you put in too much mouthpiece, it sounds very, very awful. If you put in too little, that sounds pretty awful too, and you can't get any air. So, a moderate amount of mouthpiece in the mouth. Gives you a free blowing sound. You can find that by Breathing in, starting the air, gently firming up your lip muscles, and at some point the sound will start if you're playing with good air support. too tight at the reed and you make sure that you have enough air in order to make the saxophone sound. 
One of the things I find most often with younger players and with my students is their unwillingness to put enough air into the saxophone. And that's unfortunate because the saxophone requires a lot of air, uh, more so than clarinet, if any of you may have started on clarinet and switched over to saxophone. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're putting enough volume of air. So, you heard a big dynamic range there. I started that with breath only, firming my armature muscles till the sound starts, and then follow that by making a big crescendo so that you hear your tone quality from soft to loud. Okay? Now, that can take a while, but you need to make sure that you're always supporting your tone quality. One of the things that you don't want to do is to play timidly. Because you're pinching the reed then and the notes don't want to come out. And if you don't have enough, if you're not relaxed here at the tip of the reed in the mouthpiece, you're going to close that reed off and you can't get any air on the inside. Okay? So you have to make certain that you're being relaxed here so that air can get inside your mouthpiece. You can hear that really well if you play your mouthpiece alone. And anyone with an earshot always loves this sound. But Dr. Dalton, would you play an A on that piano? Okay. Oh, the lip tear stuck. Okay, so can you tell that very loud sound on just my mouthpiece matched an A on the piano? For an alto saxophone, that is an F sharp on your horn. Nice and sound, long sounding, okay? If you're not using enough air or you pinch the reed, <laughs> sounds like that. You don't get any air into the instrument and things are pinched. Or if you blow too loud, <laughs> you know, that's not a musical sound at all. So you want to be able to play that F sharp on your horn. and keep it constant and steady. Okay, some other fundamentals of playing are hand position, okay? So, to play saxophone, your fingers need to be curved like you're touching your fingertip to your thumb on all of those, both hands. Okay, so practice that and observe as you do this that your fingers have to be curved in order to touch your thumb tip. All right? Or you can also maybe play spider games on a mirror. Okay, so that you're doing this. So you can hold your hands together and then put your fingertips together this way. It's kind of fun. All right? So see the curve to your fingers as you do that. That hand shape is what you need to do as you play the saxophone, okay? Thumbs on the back. A very good kind of thing is with your thumb, you don't want to play hopscotch between your thumb rest and the octave key, but you want to make sure that you use it with a rocking motion, that your thumb stays here and that you only use the tip of your thumb to do that. Keeping your fingers curved and on the keys, we can go C sharp to B. see well that my fingers are curved and they don't lift off the keys okay so you want to have an economy of motion that doesn't waste motion okay so it doesn't make any sense to pull your fingers off of the notes off of the keys rather <laughs> exercise like that in front of the mirror for your hand position is really helpful so you can see yourself. Right hand. And down the low C maybe. Position is doing well. 
no straight fingers, no fingers that miss the keys. Pretend you're playing clarinet and there are open holes there that you have to cover by putting your fingertips onto the pearls of the saxophone. Okay? Uh, and we have something else with, with saxophones uh, that you might need to know. And we have side keys over here, and we have palm keys over here, and we have spatula keys. So all the woodwinds kind of use one, two, three in the left hand and one, two, three in the right hand. But saxophones get to use some of these upper keys, like okay. So D key, holding the D. Next one is with your index finger, base of the index finger on the D key. Next key is the E flat key. Then for E natural, we use our index finger right hand and play the top side key over here. And then finally, the F key is played with your second finger. Okay, some of you may have an F sharp key that goes over here, but. See the motion in my wrist? So I'm moving my wrist down in order to press the E flat, I mean the D key. Okay, from the D. That's a finger motion. finger motion here, and your finger will raise to that key. You don't have to move your whole arm or your hand up to the E key. So that's chromatic high notes. You might want to refer to a fingering chart, but many times you get used to only going up to high D, and we need to be able to play on up the rest of the register, even up to F sharp. Okay. The other thing is the low keys down here, and these are problematic because they're a little bit clumsy and a little hard to do. So all of these keys over here use the low C fingering as its basis. All right, so all the fingers are in play with the exception of the little finger. Next one over here is right beside it from the G sharp is low C sharp. And then finally, the one down here, the lowest key, is for the B flat. It's much easier to play those notes if you start from the C and move down to them. Many times you'll look at a fingering like the low B put the fingering down and then try to play, doesn't come out very well. So, to get used to how those notes play, play the low C to begin with. You might even move down to the low C. And then alternate your little finger fingering with the low C fingering. Okay, a fun exercise I do is to alternate low C with all three of these, like Okay, and that's B flat, B natural, and C sharp. And so we've had working on the high notes, working on the low notes. Now, uh, in the little time we have remaining, taking the instrument apart, uh, one of the things you need to know, first of all, your ligature goes where it won't get bent. All right. Take your reed off. Put it in a reed case. And really important, especially these days when people are really aware of sanitation and healthy, no germs, is the mouthpiece really collects a lot of slime and gunk. So it's a good idea to keep things really clean by taking a soft cloth and after you finish playing, 
wipe off the mouthpiece because sometimes there's some residue of your lips left on the top. And oftentimes what I do is take, this is a special disinfecting spray you get at the music store. Uh, waterworks, or I'm not sure you want to be putting Lysol or anything like that in your mouth, but that's another good way to keep your mouthpiece clean. And very importantly, sometimes very nasty stuff collects on the inside of the mouthpiece after a while. So you can thread a handkerchief or another cloth. This one's not doing so great. Uh, through the mouthpiece so that you're cleaning out the inside of it. So it is clean and spick and span. All right, so hope you've enjoyed this introduction to some of the fundamentals of saxophone playing. And if you have any questions, I have an email that you can join. Uh, it's bingham, B-I-N-G-H-A-M, at marshall.edu. So if you have any questions, send me an email, and I'd like to help you. See you soon.